How you doing? I'm Mr. Helmers uh, from Diamond Oaks. I'm the carpentry teacher. Welcome to East Clinton Middle School. All right, so today what we're going to do is we're going to show you guys how to install a window. Joey over here and Brandon are going to show you guys how this is done. So on a new house, after you get the wrap on the outside of the house, you're going to have to install the windows. So what they're going to do is they're going to make sure that the windows are plumb and square. Plumb means straight up and down. Thanks. So he's using a level right now to check for his level, and he's going to check plumb after he gets a nail in. Brandon's on the inside actually putting a shim underneath the window to make sure that it stays horizontal. So now he's going to put the, the level on the side of the window and check that it's straight up and down plumb. If your window is not plumb, it's not going to shut correctly. Are all windows the same? No, uh, this window right here is for new construction. So it has a nailing flange on the outside. It's a vinyl window, which means that it will not rot. Um, some windows are wood. Um, other windows are wood with cladding on the outside. That helps the window from rotting. Keep the window from rotting. So he, on a typical job, he would fill every one of these nail holes with a nail. After he's finished, he's going to pull this nail out up here. If you want to pull that nail out, Joe. And that's going to that's gonna allow the building wrap the lap down over the window and make it weather tight and watertight. Um, the next thing he would do is take a adhesive tape, tape the bottom, the sides, and then the top. And that's going to keep the rain from getting in the house. The next step that he would have is install siding on the outside of the house, actually to give, keep it waterproof. Um, so that's about it for installing a window. Oh, over here, actually, we installed a window earlier today. And this is an example of the tape that we would use. So right now it would be, it's on the bottom. Uh, next you would tape the sides and then the top, obviously, because water runs downhill and you want to start at the bottom and work your way up. The next thing I'm going to show you is some other guys that are framing a roof on their house right now. So a couple of juniors and one of my seniors are working on this project. So you can see they don't have their windows and doors installed yet but they are getting ready to frame the roof up on top. And there was some math involved to uh, figure the rafters on this roof. This is what we call stick, stick framing. Some, most houses these days come with trusses, pre-manufactured trusses that they come on a truck and they'll have a crane on the job. They'll pick the truss up off the ground and set it with a crane one at a time. The way that these guys are building it is stick frame, where they're building one piece at a time. Okay, It's something that we don't do a lot of in industry right now, but it's a good way, it's good practice to know in case you have a small addition that you want to do and you don't want to pay for trusses or something like that. You can just do a small roof like this and build your own. You can see over here, The first thing that they had to do was put up ceiling rafters, ceiling, ceiling joists, I should say. So that's where the drywall will be installed on the inside. Insulation will go up on top of this by the ceiling joist also. What kind of job outlook is there in the construction industry right now? Uh, it's uh, very good. We, we get calls all the time from employers uh, looking for students, looking for uh, students to come work for them. Um, I'd say they're begging for students right now. They're begging for employees right now. So there's many different jobs you can do in construction. You can, uh, you can swing a hammer if you want your entire career. You can swing a hammer your entire career, or you can be an estimator, uh, a project manager. 
you can go on to college. Our, our program offers, uh, gives you some college credit to move on if you want to go on to Hawking College. Um, you'll save some a semester at Hawking College if you come here and complete our coursework. Uh, I have students working at Messer Construction. I have students working at uh, Dugan and Meyer Construction. Those are some pretty pretty big companies in Cincinnati. Um, I have a lot of other students that are doing small residential uh, builders. One of my students just started building the house uh, with a contractor last week, so he's doing the whole thing from the ground up. Hey, I. Right. If you get in to get in the industry right now, starting out as a high school student, I have students making in a range from twelve to fifteen dollars an hour. Last year, I had some students that were working on uh, government jobs, which are prevailing wage. They were making twenty three, twenty four dollars an hour. So uh, there's some really good jobs out there. And that's just starting out not knowing much. So it's, it's uh, the outlook is really good for jobs. Over here, we have uh, some guys doing some drywall finishing. They're going to show you how to patch a hole in drywall. Over here, we have some seniors who are working on finishing. So once the house is framed, the windows are installed, uh, they can start to wire the house and put HVAC in the house. And right now, these guys are actually trying to learn how to finish drywall. Um, what they're going to do is stand to the side, Alex. What they're doing is they're actually trying to patch a hole in drywall. So if you guys ever, your door ever hits the drywall and puts a hole in the wall like this here, this is how you want to get it. This is how you want to fix the hole. So go ahead, Alex, show us what you do. He's going to put a little mud on the wall and take a piece of tape. They call it drywall tape and cover the hole. Can you stand to the side a little bit? He's going to cover the hole with the tape, and then Alex is going to wipe the tape out, the extra drywall mud. He's trying to get it as clean as he can so the tape sticks. Wipe all the extra off. How long do you have to let it dry before you can uh, paint over top of it? Usually it's overnight. It's going to take multiple coats, usually three coats. Um, I've taught them how to do two coats right away to save a trip. Um, so they do have drywall mud that's fast setting that will uh, set in about 20 minutes. So then you can do two coats, three coats right away. So it saves you on trips to and from the job. Yeah, there is an apprenticeship program. Um, we, our apprenticeship that we have, we go on a field trip there every year, um, and they have lots of job opportunities also. And what it is, it's a four-year apprenticeship when you graduate from high school. Um, you work full-time, and once a week, every quarter, every three months, once a week, you'll go to the apprenticeship for the whole week and actually do classwork and hands-on. And the rest of the time, you're actually on the job making money. Great way. Apprenticeship is like a, a different type of way to get a degree, but you don't have any debt because you're getting paid the whole time. That That's you're doing right. It. And then there's also a pathway to get your associate's degree through the apprenticeship. You don't have to do much more than just some English classes and some math, basic math classes to get your associate's degree once you've done the apprenticeship also. So that's it. So they've got it as smooth as they can. It'll take uh, overnight to dry. The next day they can come back and put a thin, a thin layer over that. And then they should be able to sand it the day after and paint. So, and that's it. Hi everybody, I'm Mr. Chambers. I'm the electrical instructor here at Diamond Oaks. And uh, we're, we work closely with the construction crew. Um, we usually follow them after the building when they framed up everything that you just saw Mr. Helmer show you. Uh, and then we'll come in and wire things up. So here for our program, we start off, everybody starts off with a very basic uh, installation method. It's all self-contained in a small area just to learn how to do the circuits. Uh, so what I'm going to show you today is Amber's going to just work on wiring up the switch that will turn on this light. 
It's a very simple circuit, but it's what everything is based off in electricity. Um, also, after we do that, as the as the students progress through the projects, we uh, we we increase the size of the project, so it becomes a little bit more real life type projects. So what we'll show you after this is we have Travis in the building over there where he will show how he actually routes the wires and nails up the boxes and, and does the wiring in a real size building. Okay, so it looks like Amber was already quicker than what I thought she was going to be. She's I really trained her well. Anyway, so <laughs> so what she did was uh, she hooked up the switch. And what the switch does is it interrupts the power going from the electrical panel up to the light fixture. You want to go ahead and plug that into the back there? Um, and we just have a little temporary power cord here. Okay. So what you'll see is that the power can come in, and then we can, by flipping on the switch, we can allow the power to go up to the light. What we do in this, in our in our program here, like I said, everything is self-paced. We start them off small, and then we start building them up so that they understand all the basics. And then we start getting a little bit more elaborate. Uh, we'll move on over to the building over here. As the students progress through the projects, um, they will get their own room in our lab, and they will start wiring up all the rooms that are in the building. Uh, so this room to us would be something similar to a bedroom. And you're going to watch Travis. Uh, he's going to do something. We work with power tools uh, where we have to drill our holes so that we can route our cables. Uh, so he's going to nail up a light fixture box, and then he's going to route his cable on over to the light fixture box from the switch. So what you saw earlier, just a few seconds ago, was the small scale version of where the switch was and where the light was. Very easy to understand because it's right there in front of you. When you get into a regular size building, everything's a little bit more spread out. So he has to do a little bit more planning and he has to get, uh, you know, get used to other types of tools, working with ladders, even possibly mechanical lifts that will lift him up 20 feet in the air to get to where he might have to put that box. So we'll watch uh, Travis there for a second as he routes his cable. Yeah, in our program, we, we teach them all the basic electrical circuits, uh, and then we, we teach them blueprint reading as well as the, the hand tools and safety. But as we go through the projects, we always talk about what the electrical code is, because the electrical code is for the safety of the people in the building. So by the time they leave our, our program, they can wire up an entire house. Most of them have gone out working on uh, regular jobs, uh, whether it's in a residential setting like a house or in a commercial setting. Um, most of my seniors are all out working and I even have some of my juniors out working. They get that real world experience. Uh, it's a co-op just like what the construction crew can go out on. They're getting, uh, getting time on the job, they're getting paid, and they're getting their, their high school degree as well. Um, and they will also learn anything that's related to that building in the electrical code so that they install it properly. The goal for them is once they leave diamond is they go into an apprenticeship school they attend the apprenticeship school and then they get their license to become an electrical contractor or a journeyman or whatever their goal is in life we do have some that will move on to college some will go on we have one this year that's going to move on to electrical engineering so he's going to start off at cincinnati state where we have an articulation agreement uh, he'll take his basic courses there and then he'll transfer over to uc uh, and then in a few years he'll be an electrical engineer So as you can see, what you saw earlier where Amber was and she just wired up the lights, all the wires were already ran. It was very simple. And here it takes a little bit more time. So it does take a little bit more planning to get the wire routed. Um, and he has to be concerned about safety, you know, people around him and himself. Typically, when you're building a house, you put the walls up, and then in what part of the process do electrical come like before the HVAC guys come in? Obviously, before you put the drywall and all that, but kind of where in that process do your guys come in? Okay, great question. Yeah, the, uh, the electricians usually come in after the heating and air conditioning and after the plumbers. Uh, they, their stuff is a little bit larger than ours. It has, they have certain things that they have to do to make sure everything drains properly or they have enough airflow. So they get first choice of where everything is. For us, we come in afterwards and we start routing our cables. What campuses have this program besides Diamond Oaks? 
Uh, Scarlet Oaks is the other campus that has this one. Is that a what if a student is interested in this and it's not at Laurel Oaks, can they somehow take it at one of your campuses? Students can go to any campus that they want, but we have had students from East Clinton that have gone to Scarlet before. Um, sometimes there's inter-campus shuttles that may run, like they may be able to get themselves to Laurel and there may be a shuttle that'll run them to Scarlet. Um, so sometimes that busing opportunity is available, but in most cases the students usually drive and um, they do do it. They're dedicated because it is a long haul sometimes. Um, there may be some other students interested in like firefighting or culinary, something like that. So it's only offered at Scarlet, so sometimes they kind of carpool together as well. So that is an option. You don't have to go to the closest campus. You can choose based on your interest area. Um, we had another question about could you do both construction and electricity programs? I do not believe they can do both construction and electricity at the same time. We don't, uh, it, there's only one program per year that they can, uh, they can do because they're in, you're in your program. When you come to the, to the Oaks, whatever program you go to, you're in that program for half of the day. So you're usually your first year, you're in, in your morning lab. So you're there from the beginning of class until lunchtime. And then after that, you do your academics. So uh, unfortunately, you can't take two programs in the same year. You, know, you can only take one. It took like one program and then wanted to go on and get additional experiences. You could go to like a Cincinnati State or a Southern State or someplace and get, um, or Northern Kentucky University and get um, like a construction management where you could learn some more with the other areas. Exactly. So, yes. or, or like the example you gave earlier with the student going on into electrical engineering. So this can be a great foundation to build and go whatever direction you want. Right. So Travis has moved on. And, and this is just a small project. This is probably one of our earliest projects we do in the year, uh, usually in the first quarter. And, you know, but he's concerned about where he stapled his wires, making sure that they're secured, making sure he doesn't put the staple in too, too far to damage the wires. He has his connection made to his light, and now he's down here at a switch box, and he's going to make that connection. Unfortunately, this building is not ready to be powered up. Uh, the electricians fell behind again. Got to blame them for everything. Uh, I usually blame it on the heating and air conditioning guy, but there's, you're going to him next. So you guys might, might say something to him and I don't want to get in trouble. So, but we will be ready whenever, uh, you know, the rest of the building is ready. We'll be ready to power this up. They actually have another building right over there that they've done tile work in and siding and everything. It's something that has been able to be, uh, powered up and turn on all the lights and switches and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so right now he's just working on making his connections. So when you get your, your full room at our, in our lab, uh, everything slows down. It takes a lot more time to, to do all this work, to plan it and prep it and all that. So, um, and Travis has uh, been one, he finished all of his projects this year uh, and he's been doing really well. Uh, he plays football. He, he comes to school here, and he still participates in football at his home school. Um, and so, unfortunately, with his football schedule, he's not out working yet. But we're hoping after he gets done with football next year, he'll be right out there working because he does a really good job. So all he needs to do is keep his grades up and get a driver's license, maintain his attendance, and he'll be in great shape. Any of you guys notice that he has a different kind of tool belt than the construction guys used. So for each one of the different programs that you use, you have different tools that you use. So the tool belts become specialized. So his has a more room for pockets for him to put a lot of the different things that he's using, whether it be wire cutters or the wire nuts or the tester. You can see the little yellow thing in there. That's the electrical tester. A lot of times you want to test the wires before you start cutting into them. Otherwise, you can get a jolt, which is not very pleasant. So we're now in the HVAC lab, which stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And these guys have a couple of demos and things they're going to talk to you about. So take it away. Um, hi. Um, this is just a basic air conditioning system. I mean, each air conditioning system has four components. This is a compressor. This is what pushes the refrigerant all the way through. You know, it makes, so, you know, it, makes it so the stuff is moving. Like, it's, all the refrigerant is moving through here. Moving through here. This is what makes it move. It provides the pressure so it can move. This is the evaporator. This is where the heat gets pushed into the into the refrigerant and the cold air comes out. So this is what's inside your house. It makes your house cold. This is the con air mover. This is the condenser. This is where the hot air that's inside of the refrigerant, when it's transferred into here, 
he gets transferred into there, and this is where it's pushed out into the outside air and makes the refrigerant cold again, colder, so you can bring it over here and push the cold out. So, um, should we check for, should we do superheat now? All right, so, oh, it's, uh, the qual superheat's the quality of the vapor going to the compressor, coming from the evaporator to the compressor. What you want is 100% vapor with zero liquid going to the compressor. Even a small amount of liquid can completely destroy your compressor. Yes. Okay, so how do you ch how you check for it is you take this. It's a, multi it's a multimeter. You set it to the temperature setting. You take the temperature of this. Using a thermistor. Yes. This, uh, this is the suction line. coming. This is what comes off the uh, evaporator. Then what you do is you take the gauge manifold, which Brooke is holding, and you take the pressure off here, and you got to use a PG chart to find out the temperature of the, the temperature of the refrigerant. Which, what's the pressure on there? Well, we don't know what refrigerant it's using. 134. Yeah, sure. That's, uh, what, 15? No, 15. That's 25, right? 25. 25, where is 134? Okay, this is, uh, so that's 30 degrees. So, subtract 30 degrees by 41, which is the temperature given by the, you know, thermistor. So 11 is your superheat. And that's how you find superheat. And that's how you depend whether you need to know if you need to add more refrigerant or take some out of it. Hmm? The data plate would be in the system, oh, not... But, sorry. So do you have a specific, like, this time of year, this is what you'd be doing, right? Because people are gearing up for summer and checking out the air conditioning. So when you go on an air conditioning call, is this what you would do at somebody's house? Uh, yeah, depending on the problem. I mean, okay. you're supposed to start, when you're troubleshooting, you're supposed to start the thermostat. Okay. And then you kind of just work your way through the problems depending on what's working and what's not working. This is the TXV. This, if this is present, you got to check for subcooling, which okay. we're not going to do right now. Which what you do is, is um, what's it called? You take the high side, the red gauge here, you put the hose onto the uh, liquid line. Is that look, that's liquid line. And then you do the same thing. Take the temperature off the liquid line, and then you take the pressure and convert it to temperature using the PT chart. Subtract them, and then you get your subcooling. It all depends on whether they want to go into HVAC or uh, just go into refrigeration. Refrigeration, you can do anything. Uh, normally, they go in like the commercial side, the walk-in coolers, uh, reach-in coolers. It might be your favorite beverage place. Uh, that's refrigeration type stuff. Or it could be even a cooler at, let's say, your school, for example, where they uh, put all the food at uh, in the uh, dining facility. Uh, if they decide they want to go into residential heating and air, uh, which a lot of the folks do, there's uh, several sides to that. One could just be installed, and they also have service work. That's the troubleshooting and repair. If there's a trouble call, they would go to the service side, and they would go out, typically go out to somebody's house and start troubleshooting and repair the system. Or, you know, they could go commercial. Uh, commercial in this area would typically fall under Local 392. That's our union. That's the pipe fitters union where we fall under. Uh, with them, the union, uh, you're going to continue going through more education, and they're going to uh, set you up with a company. Uh, that company is going to work you, uh, could be in any major building, mall, uh, airport, uh, schools use a lot of them. This, we have so many op job openings right now, we're not going to have enough people to fill them. Uh, it's, it's just huge. This is what it looks like actually inside of a because in, in an actual air conditioner, it's not all going to be laid out like that. Huh? Oh yeah, this is a rooftop unit for a whole building. This has a little, this has a, you know, a little manifold for heating, and then it's got the compressors and evaporators and condensers for cooling in the entire thing. Different kinds of compressors are used for different kinds of units. Uh, right here, I mean, you just got your two compressors. There are two compressors in here because it's like there's two complete, there's two air conditioning systems in here. It's like one's you know for the main cooling and the other one's for like supplemental cooling. Like, yeah, it's like for, like, if the one's not doing enough, this one adds on to it. It makes it yeah, do its job better. For a giant building, they put one of these in the roof. Instead of having a bunch of, of like a big furnace in the bottom, they just got the furnace up here. You know, it runs on nat this runs on natural gas. It does all the refrigerant things. And then uh, then there's schematics. If you come here to do this, you're going to need to know schematics. This tells you what's going on electricity, like, wire-wise. It helps you map out all these so you actually know what's going on because memorize all the different symbols. It's pretty, it's not that hard, but there's a lot to, you gotta make sure, if you pay attention, it's not that hard, but it's like a second language almost. You just gotta know what all this means. But once you got it down, you won't forget it. It's like, once it's in your head, it's like riding a bike, you don't forget. Electrical portion of it, the chemical portion of it, and the mechanical portion of it. Okay, and then you said there's, like, black iron piping and... 
there's yeah there's different sheet metals to build like duct. So there's a lot of different career fields you can go into right so it can't you could do the installation going out if somebody's having problems and do a troubleshooting or you could just go in and do all new systems where you're laying the sheet metal in a new building or whatever Okay, so cool. So that lets the eighth graders know a little bit more about all the different job possibilities. Because sometimes when they think HVAC, they just think it's that person that comes when their furnace is broke. But there's a lot of different aspects. So if they actually decide they want to continue their education, they can because we fall under mechanical engineering. So they'd actually study to, be, to become a mechanical engineer. All right, so this is just a basic furnace. I think that's an 80% of the Yes, it's an 80%. Yes, it's an 80%. So this is what most people have in their homes. How it works is, is when you turn it on, it gets a call for heat. This is on. Well, it's not a call for it's not a call for heat right now. So, um, this will create negative pressure to trigger this switch. This will clear all the pipes, make sure there's no gas left over. This will trigger. This will turn on this negative pressure switch, which lets everything know that there's all the gas are cleaned out. Once that happens, it'll run through some safety circuits to make sure all the other safeties are good to go, so you know it doesn't catch on fire or nothing. After that, it'll make it'll uh start the process of igniting the gas. The gas valve will allow gas to go through, it'll ignite. And down in there, I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but there's a little thing right there. It's called a flame sensor. It makes sure there's a flame so it's not just pushing out natural gas everywhere. It sends a small uh, DC signal down to the circuit board down here, which lets it know that there's flames burning. After that, it waits a little bit, you know, let the heat exchanger heat up, then the blower kicks on, air moves through, and it heats your house. There goes, there goes the inducer. It's clearing out all the pipes. You're going to hear that pressure switch click. Once that clicks, this is going to start up. There it goes. Now to see the gas ignited. Now once the gas is ignited, the flame sensor is going to send a signal down the board to let it know that there's flames. Then you'll hear the blower kick on, which will happen soon. Once that happens, hot air will blow through here until the, heat for, the call for heat is satisfied. But yeah, the flame's got to be a certain color or else incomplete combustion will happen. And if that happens, it's bad. There's a gas that'll go up called carbon monoxide that can kill people in the house. Doesn't blow up. And complete combustion doesn't blow up. It just makes poisonous gas. So you can hear the blower going. This is getting warm. You can put your hand over here. Warm gas coming out. Or not warm gas, warm air coming out. Um, how the uh, gas gets there, how the, the black pipe right here, this is how the natural gas gets in here. Back there, you got your main line where all the gas is being distributed from. So it comes in through here. It's got its unions. This is so as you can take it apart. So you know it's it's not just one big length of pipe. You can take it apart if you need to. Without breaking. Without yeah, without breaking it. You got shut off valve back here. I don't think they can see that. There's a shut off valve. It's a just a little thing you turn to shut off the gas in case you know you need to shut it off. You got your drip leg here. This is so in case any solid materials come through the natural gas leg. If anything stubs through when it's being sent here from the gas companies, the dirt and dust will collect instead of. So you clogging can clean it later. So, like in case the gas manifolds get clogged, this prevents it because the dirt will never get there in the first place. It's because it will come through here, and so the gas the gas will come down here still, but the dirt will continue to go down. It won't go through. So that's just a little, you know, maintenance thing to keep preventative maintenance sort of thing. The gas comes through here, goes into the manifold. Once it does that, you know, starts heating. Typically, once they get to uh, their senior year. They get an opportunity to go out on job placement where they can go two to three times or two to three days a week. Instead of coming to school, they just go out to uh, to the job site. I did bring in uh, three of my seniors who are on uh, job, work job placement, just in case you have any questions about that. Right now, they're enjoying going out, making money, and coming to school two days a week. 